Hello and welcome to the beach. Okay, it's not the beach. Um, you will see in this video pictures that I took at the beach, some short videos as well. But this video um, is mostly going to be me talking in this chair and um, some clips and some pictures. And away we go. Here at Napa Tree, there is a wide diversity of seaweed, um, according to their own research. And, um, and it did appear to me as well. And the beach, which obviously is rocky offshore, um, there's some sand on the beach, so it's not a purely rocky beach, which would have a whole different set of organisms associated with it. But having the rocks offshore also leads to quite a, a wide variety of seaweed. So, some of the pictures that you'll see, they'll be um, sea lettuce, which is ulva, which is a type of green algae, which is edible. And this sea lettuce, that green algae is, if you talk about the classification of all of these, we think about them in the classical sense as being in protista, which doesn't exist. It, it, it's a group of eukaryotes that we put together and they were small and they kind of fit nowhere else and we just threw them together. Well, these aren't really that small, are they? I mean, seaweed's not small, but a lot of them are small. So green algae, though, is a... If we talk about the classification of green algae, again, it could be classified with plants and viridian plantae and um, sea lettuce fits in that group or... Um, it, they're connected to plants. That much we agree upon. But there's still some debate upon where the branches occur and exactly how to classify these organisms. Um, most of them do not live in salt water. So when you think about green algae, it's not typical that they're in a marine environment, but sea lettuce is. Also at Napa Tree, we do have sugar kelp, which is a type of brown algae. It's huge. Uh, kelp, kelp forests, if you've ever heard of them. That, that's how much, uh, how large these seaweeds can get. So that these brown algae kelp can form basically like a forest under the ocean. And you will see this washed up on the beach. Again, rocky shoreline, good place for them to grow. And they obviously do. Also, you will see red algae. And brown, and brown and red algae are not as closely related to plants as green algae. And there are significant morphological differences on the cellular level. The red algae here is Gracilaria and Irish moss. You'll see both of them in there. The, the Irish moss is darkish, um, kind of a, a blackish color at this point because it's been dried on the beach. It's, it's dark purplish in real life um, when it's alive and in the water more of a reddish color to it as well um, but again the classification system is a mess when it comes to the red and brown algae as well as green algae and still not enough agreements upon that there, there's some there's more than there used to be And if you take a look at the rockweed, you'll actually see an example of convergent evolution. That these parts of this seaweed resemble parts of a plant. Like they have holdfasts instead of roots. Holdfasts will stick them to the rocks. And you can see that with the rockweed, the, the fucus, which is, is the rockweed. Um, they have bladders, air bladders, which aid them in being able to have their tops float up. They're photosynthetic. So they, kind of, they do need to point up towards the light, which is coming from the surface of the water, right? So there's that. Um, the stem-like portion of them is called the stipe, and it has blades like leaves, uh, but that's not really what they are. They, they resemble that because they have the same types of pressures upon them that land plants would So the jelly that you see in this picture 
is called a lion's mane jelly. And I don't call them jellyfish in this video especially because they're not fish at all. They're in a dairy. Um, and the lion's mane jelly is very interesting in that it can be up to two meters in diameter. It can be huge. This one was really small. It was like right under my foot almost. It was right there. Um, but they are widespread in their range and we do have them in the northeast coast of North America and, and, and this is in Rhode Island and um, they can be quite large especially in cooler waters and they can be clear as well. Uh, they do start in a polyp stage, which means that they're going to be, instead of the medusa stage, which is what you think of as a jelly, where you have them look in this kind of a shape, and they kind of pulsate and move. They're the opposite. They're upside down, from what we think of, in their larval stage. They're a polyp, and they grow on the seafloor, and then they come up, and then they float around. So this is ob obviously an adult. Even though it's small, they don't all grow that long. The fin that you see coming out of the water in the video, and kind of in the picture, which is really bad, but in the video, is from a mola mola, an ocean sunfish. There are five different species of, of sunfish. Mola mola is this one. This is the most common one. They're very widespread. Um, they're, sunfish are all over the place, including in Japan, where they made a Pokemon out of them, basically. Um, but anyway, so they seem like they have no tail it's kind of the way that they're built they don't have that long caudal fin at all um, and they are the largest bony fish in the world yes he's on the side that's why that the, the um, or she that's why that fin is sticking out of the water it confuses people sometimes but they come up to the surface they also go way deep into the ocean they do eat jellies it's one thing they eat they also eat other things too they have a more diverse diet than we used to think and they do bask on the surface in the epipelagic zone, which is towards the top of the pelagic ocean, out in the open ocean. And there's been a couple of hypotheses for why this occurs. One deals with searching for jellies and food. Um, two, which goes along with that really, uh, is for thermal regulation because it's quite cold if you dive deep into the ocean. And we think this is probably the reason that they really do it. And there have been people who pointed out that they have a high parasite load and this may aid in getting rid of the parasites, but that hasn't really been shown to, without mutualistic relationships with birds and fish. Um, the sun itself is not enough. It, th this might be part of it though, and I don't want to discount that completely. So that's a mola mola. And like I said, they're quite large. The dolphins that you see in this video clip are white striped dolphins. They're not like the bottom of nose dolphins that you may see from shore in New York. Um, you may be able to see porpoises and other things as well, but the, the most common dolphins that I've seen in New York, New Jersey area have been the bottle nose dolphins. These tend to be a little bit more out to sea. They're quite common here too, but not usually from the coast. And um, they're in the video, so take a look. Seeing here today, we've made it so that it's not a fishery, a viable fishery anymore. Um, we're definitely seeing an influx in Atlantic Menhaden. The herring uh, fishery is shut down. They're trying to make sure that uh, population grows back. Also, the mackerel fishery, they're not really catching too many mackerel. Uh, this year, last year, they were definitely. This boat that we're on right now, as you can clearly see, okay. Obviously, it would have been very difficult to make great videos and be corona safe on that boat. There are too many people around as well. So here we go. 
I did take a boat ride, which you will see the video clip um, here and there, a couple clips of Eastern Egg Rock and the ocean around it. And Eastern Egg Rock is a place where puffins, Atlantic puffins, were reintroduced. Um, they were no longer there. So they nest in these little like crevices between rocks and you can actually check out. They, they have a camera set up that you can look inside the burrows where they lay their one single egg and they are, um, they exhibit a high degree of phyllopatry where they come back to the same site every year. And puffins are not penguins. We have guillemots and we have puffins on that island and as, long, as well as terns and you'll see the terns are very loud they're like seagulls kind of but they're a little different um, very closely related to seagulls as are puffins and the guillemots now they're more closely related to shorebirds than penguins they're not like penguins but they look like penguins another example of convergent evolution where the, the selection pressures are the same they turn out similarly I will include some better pictures of those two alcids or auks that's what they really are called um and the puffins are what really well we we are trying to help out the rosia terns on the island the arctic terns on the island as well as everything else on the island too there's eider ducks that are swimming in the ocean there but it was really set up to as a restoration project and, and to reintroduce puffins to the area Audubon Society and Project Puffin, uh, they have scientists and interns out here through, throughout the summer. They're doing a bunch of different things. There's an understanding that you know, I'll have to stand there. The puffin fly. He really needs to be able to see all the buoys. Thank you. 